Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, I know I'm at the tail end of a very long session here, so I'll try to make it as lively as possible, though. Uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, so you've heard a lot from the past two talks, I think a few references at least to the stuff that, oh yeah, we can make these things robust. Uh, we can even sometimes prove it, but uh, there, <laughs> there wasn't much talk about how you do that. So this talk is going to be about how you actually uh, can get provably robust deep learning models. Uh, and I think this was actually, a, I, I mean, I actually think this is, these, these techniques um, are at this point being sort of, they're, they're becoming pretty widespread, so I think it's fairly well known that you actually can do these things. But even, I think the point I want to highlight is that even a few years ago, we didn't really know this. We didn't know this was possible uh, maybe two years ago to build provably robust models. Um, and again, what that means, I'll, I'll get into what I mean by that. Um, but I think this has been a field with, that's seen remarkable progress in the past two years. And I'm really excited about both the progress we've made and the challenges ahead uh, on this problem. And I should say, this is really the, the two main people that have um, been leading this work in my group are Eric Wong and Jeremy Cohen. Uh, Eric's been leading a lot of the work on the convex relaxation type, type methods, and Jeremy's been leading a lot of the work in the randomized smoothing methods, uh, and then it's with some collaborators as well. So they were the ones really doing most of this, this actual, the actual work here. Um, so I'm going to start off with a brief background on adversarial attacks, kind of what I mean by that. It's, it's already been done by everyone else in this, so I'm going to skip over that quickly. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about these two main techniques uh, which we can actually use to get classifiers, which not just sort of empirically robust or robust to the best of our knowledge, but which actually have associated guarantees that you know, changing the inputs in certain ways will not change the resulting classifier or the resulting classification of these things. Um, and these two ways are via convex relaxations and then via randomized smoothing. Um, and it's sort of interesting, these are two very different approaches that accomplish something very similar in the end. Um, and I think actually bridging these two things is one of the big challenges that I'll at least briefly mention for the challenges of, of, of the road ahead. Um, but the other thing I'll highlight here is, uh, I, th I think they get a bad, I mean, I, I think norm bounds, I, I'm gonna work largely with norm bounds here. I think norm bounds uh, are actually quite useful despite uh, Nicholas's uh, comments before. But they, but, but, but they are also wrong, right? Norm bounds are not the way we should assess, assess uh, security. And so I'll talk a little bit about, in particular there, about some ways we have about moving beyond just security uh, with respect to norm bounds. So let me just jump right in. Uh, feel free to interrupt me. Actually, at any point, we can be a little interactive here if it helps people stay awake during the last of a three-hour session. OK, so let's talk a little bit of background on adversarial attacks. So we've all seen this before, right? That you have a, you have a picture, add some noise, become something else. Um, Alex used it. I guess the big question that I have as a researcher is do I use the the pig picture or the panda picture when I show this. And in honor of being here at MIT, uh, where you know, this is Alex's home turf, I'm going to use the, the pig picture. If I go to Google, I'll use, you know, in honor, I'll use the panda picture there. Um, but what we're doing really fundamentally, and this has also been, been mentioned so far, is that we're, we're really moving from this notion of loss as being something we evaluate on uh, test points to loss being something we evaluate in the worst case over some region. Right, and, this is the, and to be clear, this is actually what I think we should be very clear about what we mean by robustness, right? So there's some recent work on like robustness to av like average case robustness, things like this. That's not actual robustness, right? If you talk about average case things, that's not just expectation. Robustness, sort of by definition, this goes back to robust optimization, robust control, these things. It's explicitly a worst case performance you're gonna get over some region. So in the case of classification, robust loss is the worst case over some perturbation in some region of uh, our function applied, of the loss of, uh, of our function applied to that, to that perturbed point. And that's what I mean by robust loss, and I think that's what everyone should mean by robust loss, though I know there's some debate there. Um, I should also mention, I'm, I'm surprised this is being additive here. It could be, it doesn't have to be additive too. It could be like multiplicative or things like that, but additive is sort of a pretty standard way of doing things. Um, of course, the big question is what you allow in terms of your perturbation region. We'll get back to that in a second. I am going to assume largely we're talking about things for the first, you know, two thirds of the talk, I'm going to assume we're talking about things like norm balls that we're all familiar with. Um, there's been a lot of work uh, on this topic. I think its current resurgence is, is due to some work in, in deep learning in particular, but also some work by, um, uh, in other contexts as well, um, by Biggio et al. Et al. 
Um, but I should say that this, actually, this idea goes back a really long time. It's actually not a new idea. So these same ideas came up in robust optimization in the 70s. Um, the, the idea of max margin classification is actually really related to robustness, right? A max margin classifier is the most cla robust classifier, at least in, in, uh, for, for the linear case in terms of L2 norms. Um, and so, so these are not really new ideas, but I do believe that their instantiation in deep learning methods in particular does raise new problems. Because we actually have a pretty good handle, at least mathematically, on robustness when it comes to linear models, um, sort of things like linear programming and stuff like this. But, but we, for a long time, we really didn't have a handle on it when it came to deep models. And that's what I want to really focus on in this, in this uh, talk, is what are the complications that arise when you talk about deep learning? Now, before I get into that, I think this is also a point everyone's uh, made so far today. But, but it is worth spending some time to think about, you know, should we really care about these things? Do these things really matter? Um, and I think so. Uh, and, and I mean, it's, it's a good question, right? Because you probably don't have an adversary attacking your classifier that can arbitrarily change pixels only up to a certain L infinity ball, right? That's a pretty unrealistic threat model. You're not actually going to encounter in practice. Um, so the question is, should we really care about these things in practice? And I would still say yes to this for two reasons. Um, the first is that you know, there are these physical attacks that you know, these things do generalize to the real world. And while these attacks are not in the space of you know, L infinity perturbations, they still are things that can be reasonably described with, with some sort of specific threat model. And they do actually affect the, you know, the performance classifiers in the real world. So you, know, you can have stop signs be misclassified. We have some work on basically making all detectors. You, you, can, you can put a sign in an image away from the objects that will actually make all the detected objects in that scene vanish when it, with, with, with a model like YOLO and things like this. So there's a lot of um, things you can do. I mean, this sort of can publish infinite papers on more and more attacks and, and more and more settings about things you can do. Um, but the other point that I think is really important, and the reason why I like to think about this, is, is sort of what actually gets at what Alex was talking about earlier, which is the, the fact that um, these examples really bring to light the fact that whatever deep networks are learning, they aren't what we think they're learning, right? Because we think of a dog as being a dog because it has these features to it. Um, and whatever, you know, whatever they are learning, it's not that. Or I should say it's not just that, certainly. Right? They're learning other things as well, as these examples make very clear. And that really raises interesting questions about what deep classifiers are really learning. And so the, the, the study of how you build classifiers that, that can't learn sort of the the, the things we don't want them to learn uh, is a really valid and, and an important direction in research. OK, so, so then what's our problem? Well, the problem I'm going to focus on uh, for now, then, is just how we go about building a robust classifier. And I would actually like to say a provably robust classifier, but I'll get with what, what I mean by that in a second. So in normal classification, you know, so basically we, we don't want it to be an uh, airliner anymore. We, we want it to be a pig again. So the idea here is actually very simple. The idea for normal classification is that we minimize the expected loss of examples drawn from some distribution, the expected loss of our classifier <coughs> evaluated on those examples. But the whole point of adversarial robustness is that we're now evaluating the performance of our classifier on a different loss function, on the worst case loss over some perturbation region of that, of that, same, uh, of that same function there. And so, the obvious thing to do is to move from the notion of training, tr now, now the sort of the training part, the minimizing over our network parameters theta, to move from just this formulation to a formulation where you actually try to minimize this thing we care about, the worst case, we're trying, gonna try to now minimize the worst case loss over these things. Um, and this is exactly the, 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 uh, the strategy that we actually want to adopt here. We wanna do actual robust optimization over our classifier to get the best possible robust performance. And that should, of course, of course be our objective. And the funny thing, honestly, is it took so long to arrive at this, right? That people tried for so long to do sort of little hacks that would try to get this instead of just trying to solve this directly, um, which is what we should all be doing from the beginning. And to be clear, I think, I mean, adversarial training was doing this from the beginning. It was actually very clear they were doing that. But we took a detour for a long time and tried a bunch of other stuff, which was not this, I think, very foolishly. Uh, OK, so, so how do you, of course, that's easy to say. How do I actually train this thing? Right? How do I actually minimize now a worst case loss? It isn't, isn't so obvious anymore. You know, how, how do I get gradients through that? And in this setting, there really are two ways you can do this. And, 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 and um, 
this is sort of the distinction I make between the, the, you know, the more heuristic ways, though not super heuristic, but still discipline, and, and the provable ways. So the first thing you can do is the, the first sort of proposed approach for this, which is actually also kind of the, the obvious thing to do, which is adversarial training. Um, and so what you do is you basically just take gradients, not gradients over this loss, but gradients over this loss. And both simultaneously kind of try to find the worst case uh, perturbation you can have, and then take gradient steps over that, over that worst case perturbation. It turns out doing that, so basically first, you know, having an inner loop that first tries to find the worst case loss, and then takes gradient steps over your model parameters at that worst case point, that is exactly just doing gradient descent on this robust loss, or at least to the extent that which you can actually solve that inner maximization problem exactly, it is exactly just doing gradient descent over this loss here. Um, and this has become, I mean, this, this or a version of this was actually the first proposed uh, strategy. You just take these adversarial examples and put them into your training set. That's exactly what's going on here, functionally. Um, then then, then uh, Alex has some work, uh, follow-on work on this that really, well, I should actually say, um, <laughs> two Alex's. <laughs> Alex Karakian had some follow-on work on this about sort of doing this in an iterative method, and then uh, Alexander Madri had some work on this, uh, looking at it a little bit more uh, in terms of this, in terms of sort of the, the way this is actually just doing gradient descent. But I'm actually not gonna talk about it. And, and this is, a, I, should, I should say one thing too. That method actually does work empirically. So this is not like the others, you know, this is not a heuristic defense like we normally think about. There are things that are broken, you know, two weeks after they're released by uh, Nicholas Carlini and his, and his friends. Um, this, this is actually a reasonable set of strategies here that if you do it properly, empirically seems to work quite well and give still actually the best empirically robust models we can come up with. But we still can never be quite sure, right? We actually don't know with these models what their actual performance is. They're, they seem good, but they get broken a little bit in bits. So, you know, uh, Alex put up a model that on, on CIFAR that gets like 46% accuracy, and it's been kind of chipped away since then to like 44, 43, that might down to now. Um, and so we don't quite know where the limits are with these empirical methods. All we can do is, you know, try the best attacks we can find on them, and, yeah, you know, that's all we can really say. So, the alternative is, what if we want some way of getting provable bounds, provable certificates, and I'm, I, these two words are used interchangeably by others and by my, well, by myself and by others, so there's no difference between certifi certified or provable, I'm gonna use those as, as synonyms in this context at least, but can we get bounds where we know without any doubt that if we take our input point and we perturb it in some region around our around original data point, that we will not be able to change its class value. In other words, no adversarial attack within that range would actually succeed at flipping the class label. And of course, this is also symmetric, right? So if we, if we classify a point and um, the, the how, even without knowing the true class, if we classify a point a certain way and we see that no uh, perturbation of that point changes in a certain, changes the classification, the predicate classification in a certain region, region, we know it also can't be an adversarially, like an already adversarially perturbed example because it can't be on the other side of the boundary and, and been perturbed to its current point. So if we can do this, we can get very strong guarantees about whether points can or cannot be potentially adversarial. Now again, this is all subject, of course, to the constraints on the threat model, what we're allowing how we're allowing the attacker to perturb the points. But this is, I think, the best, our best strategy we have for really getting an understanding, not just sort of empirically, but really you know, a, a guarantee and, a, and, and being certain that we have models that cannot be fooled. And this is what I'm going to talk about how we do. Okay. Now, how do we do that? Because that seems hard, right? Um, so what we're, the, 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 the agenda here, really, for both these things, and it's a little bit, that they approach it in very different ways, but we're gonna talk about two different techniques for doing that, um, one via convex relaxations and one via randomized smoothing. And these are the two dominant approaches for doing, for getting provable bounds. Um, there are actually several different perspectives on these, these convex relaxations. You can derive them in multiple ways, multiple different groups derive them kind of in equivalent ways, uh, independently. Um, but, but this technique and then later randomized smoothing technique, um, they really are the dominant ways of, of doing this. And what they both do is they both essentially form a guaranteed upper bound on this loss. Um, a basically a way of saying that, you know, you cannot maximize the loss more than a certain amount. And that will tell you effectively that you cannot, um, you, that you really are not able to, uh, 
change a class label for a certain for a certain classification, and doing so actually lets you train a classifier in some cases to minimize his upper bound directly. Though actually that's not quite the same for the two cases, so I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so let me talk about now um, the first sort of a, a technique we, we we started working on this uh, to to address this problem, which is uh, using convex relaxations. Uh, I think I, I started around like 340. Is that right or so? And it's, okay, well. I'll try to keep things not too much. All right, sounds good. Um, 335, maybe. All right. So, okay, so I'm talking about the convex relaxation approach. And I'll start trying to go a little bit quicker now because I do want to get through both these things and have some time at the end. Um, but I want to give a, a, a high level idea about how these things work. We're not, we're not going to get into the, in, into the details of the math here, but I'm going to give a high level idea. So, the first question I want to ask is why is this hard? What makes it hard to actually train a robust classifier? And what makes it hard is the nature of decision boundaries and sort of perturbation regions for deep classifiers. So if I take a nice, say, you know, L infinity ball in my input space, and I pipe it through a deep classifier, what comes out the other side is this nasty, non-convex, uh, combinatorially complex decision region of reachable points, sorry, not decision region, but just reachability region of reachable points under this deep network, right? And it's non-convex because this deep network is non-linear, and so it's applying a non-linear transformation to our nice convex set, which is it's destroying all the nice properties in it. So what we're gonna do, the, st the strategy we're gonna adopt, is we're going to actually form convex outer bounds around these reachability regions. This is why we call it a convex relaxation technique. We're relaxing the reachability regions, and we're gonna try to find the worst case points in those outer regions. Because if we can do that, if we know that there's, for example, that no point in the outer region crosses the decision boundary, we know we're safe, right? We know that, of course, no real point could have crossed that either. So that's the technique here. We're gonna outer bound these reachability, these sort of reachability regions using uh, a bunch of different techniques. <laughs> but there actually are multiple ways you can, you can form outer bounds, including simple things like interval bounds, which actually also work reasonably well in a lot of cases. What is my, what is the attraction of convexity? The attraction of convexity is, if I have a convex region that, uh, that I'm outer bounding my situation region with, I can actually find the worst case point in that efficiently. So the problem with these regions here is that, that because they're common really complex, you know, finding the worst case, finding the point in this reachability region, this red region, closest to the boundary, for example, that's a mixed integer program with a number of variables equal to the number of activations in the network. It's just not solvable. If you have a convex, a convex region, it's tractable now to find the worst case point in that region. Now, by some definition of tractable, which we'll get into how we actually do that in practice, but it's tractable. And this gives you the ability to do this. There's also some really nice features of, of convexity that deal with duality, which is also what we actually use to get these bounds. Um, but those are, but, that, but that's, the, that's the rationale, the high level rationale for convexity. Okay, so let's talk about how we, I mean, I've, I've stated a nice picture here. Uh, but the obvious question is how do I actually find these bounds? What, what, what does it actually correspond to? What do I do to find them? <coughs> and I'm actually gonna take it through how we find them in three steps. So the first idea, which is actually the key one here, which is the simplest idea, is just the following picture. So suppose, so we're gonna assume that these networks are all formed by rel use uh, as a nonlinearity. And actually it's easy to extend to other cases too. The same picture does apply, or a similar picture applies, but let's just assume they're all rel use. Right, so those are already pretty powerful networks. Lots of networks just have rel use, so it's pretty good. Um, Let's further assume, and this is actually not at all obvious, but let's further assume just for now that I, uh, that I know a certain activation, and I'm calling Z hat here the pre-activation is before you apply the ReLU, the Z is after you apply the ReLU. I'm gonna assume that Z hat is, um, we know somehow that it's bounded between some lower bound L and some upper bound U. So let's assume that you know that somehow. We'll get to that in a second, how you get that. Um, if you know that, then I can just, real, so, so what the activation is saying is that the pre and post activations have to lie on this line, right? The, the post activation is the rel, is the ReLU of the pre-activation. Well, all that we're gonna do is we're gonna say we're gonna take that constraint, this is a non-convex constraint, of course, because it's, you know, uh, uh, having something be on a, you know, uh, uh, on, a, on a line like this, on a, on a, well, not on a line, on, two, on a line segment, two, two line segments like that is a non-convex constraint. 
We're going to relax this just to say the pre and post definitions now have to lie in the convex hull of this thing, which is just a triangle. Just three linear inequalities here. And here's what's really nice about this. Now what we're saying is, we're, we're, we're relaxing this, right, because in this network here, the, the pre-activation could be, you know, negative one, but we still have a positive post-activation. We're allowing for more possible values of the hidden units than you can actually achieve in the network. But in doing so, we make the problem convex. Because finding the worst case point in this setting, so basically looking here, finding kind of the worst case point, the point closest to the decision boundary in this relaxed setting is actually just a linear program, right? And it's a linear program because you're basically minimizing some direction, that's, that's just a, a vector in your last layer hidden units, subject to a bunch of constraints. But the constraints are, well, the first constraint is the, the, the first layer activations could be within some epsilon ball or uh, within some epsilon ball of the, of the initial point. And the other constraints are saying that some linear function of the previous layer and the next layer have to lie in this, in this triangle here. Okay? Those are all, these are just linear equalities for the, for the sort of the, the, the linear parts of the layer and linear inequalities for these constraints now. Together that equals a linear program. So finding the worst case perturbations is now tractable, at least in, you know, for as far as the theory people are concerned, maybe. Uh, polynomial time by just solving a linear program. So that's, that's great, great news. Um, and that's idea number one. But there's a couple problems here. Um, the first of all is this, this linear program is the size of, has number of variables equal to the number of hidden units in the network. And you have to solve it once to make, you know, a single prediction or in the case of training uh, to get a single gradient on a single example. Um, and that's not really going to scale, right? Solving, you know, linear programs are, are, you know, cubic at least in the number of hidden units. You, you, you're never going to actually be able to run to solve anything reasonable uh, with a linear program. So what we do instead is we use a trick from duality. And I won't get into too much details here because this is where it gets a little bit in the weeds. Um, but the point is that every linear program has an associated program called its dual problem, right? And the dual actually has this nice property that any dual feasible solution is a bound on the optimal solution of a linear program. And it's a bound in the right way. So basically what we're doing in some sense is we're, if we look at the dual problem for this linear program, we're kind of thinking about an outer bound on our original convex outer bound. There's one outer bound from the relaxation of the ReLUs, another one by looking at a dual problem instead. So that seems like we're you know, getting pretty loose now, but the nice thing about the dual problem is, is which is sort of an amazing property, but it, it makes sense when you think about it, but it's, it was amazing the first time I, I saw it. Um, uh, I mean, we, <laughs> particularly clearly, like, when we saw it as, as, as a whole. Um, but what, what, what was sort of amazing is that it turns out that you can construct a dual feasible solution to this linear program with a single backward pass through the network. So this is totally wild, there's no reason, I mean, this isn't obvious at all this will happen at first, but what, what we're saying is that for the cost of a single back prop pass, if I know my upper and lower bounds, that's a big if, but if I know those, um, I can construct a guaranteed bound on the worst case solution to this, this linear program, i.e. I can get actually a bound on whether or not I'm capable of flipping my label. Um, and so to be clear, we, we're not actually advocating that we solve the dual problem. All we're saying is we use a single backpropagation path to the network to come up with a dual feasible solution, which gives us in turn a certified bound on the quality or on the objective value of that linear program, which in turn gives us a certified bound on whether or not we can flip a label. And to be clear, this is an outer bound, so it's definitely loose. Lots of cases where there's no adversarial example when we say there might be, but, but, but there is. It, it is a guaranteed bound. Um, okay, so, so the, the last thing I'll say is I've been kind of skirting this issue the whole time, which is I've said sort of assume we have upper and lower bounds for each activation. And that's not actually a minor point um, because the activations themselves kind of dictate how tight that bound is. You can imagine, let's, let's go back for a second to this one. You can imagine that if, you know, if, if our lower bound is just all the way out here and our upper bound is all the way out here, then I could basically take, you know, a point that was really, really negative here 
and have an arbitrarily large uh, post-activation for you, know, a negative pre-activation. That's a very, very big violation of the ReLU, of the ReLU constraint. So the worse these bounds are, the, t the looser and looser our approximation is. So we want to get, in some sense, tight bounds to, to, to have the tightest possible kind of constraints on, on, our, on our relaxation. Um, and fortunately, we actually, think about it for a second even, we sort of already know how to do this. Because finding the lowest value, or at least approximate it pretty well, because finding sort of the lowest possible value, say, an activation could take on, um, that is actually just the exact same thing as solving kind of an, another adversarial robustness problem up until layer, up until sort of an intermediate layer in the network. So what I mean by that is, if I want to have the problem of tell me how big this unit can get, I can use my same relaxation of all the layers up until this point to just maximize the value of that layer. That's another linear program. Or I can also equivalently minimize the value of this one activation there with another linear program. So basically by solving a chain, you know, again in theory here, by solving a sequence of linear programs, I could construct kind of the tightest possible bounds I could get on all these different mid-level uh, mid activations, and I just do it kind of layer by layer. I just sort of build the first layer ones, then second layer ones, and third layer ones, et cetera. Now, to be clear, again, doing that all with actual linear programs is not tractable, but you can, so you can use the same tricks of duality to solve these things in a relatively efficient way, such that it basically, in the worst case, uh, amounts to work that is uh, quadratic in the number, uh, the total number of hidden units in the network. That's still, that's a huge improvement from you know, solving an LP for each uh, unit in the network, but it's still not great, right? It's still quadratic. Every network, every sort of actual algorithm you have is, is, is linear in the network, um, but we can actually solve that too, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so we can bring it down to linear with some tricks as well. Before I talk about that, let me sort of just kind of wrap this all together, because I got a little bit into the weeds here. So let me kind of wrap this all together. The high level idea here is, normally in training a neural network, you will minimize the sum of losses on your data points uh, of your prediction function uh, with the, you know, with your prediction function, the true label with some loss function, right? That's the standard way you train a neural network. What we are advocating for here is to essentially minimize this thing instead, right? The worst case loss of this thing, but this is hard to compute. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna upper bound this and we're going to have some other functions. It's a complicated function, to be clear. It's like you have to iteratively compute upper bound, you know, outer, like upper and lower bounds, then do one more backprop pass to get the actual final bound you have. But all of that can be done. And importantly, all of that can be coded up in an automatic differentiation toolkit, such that in the end, all we get is a different function, where if you just plug this function in, it's a complicated function, does all this sort of you know, backward and forward passes, but it's a complicated function, but once you put it in, it is a guaranteed upper bound on the worst case loss this classifier could suffer. And because everything is actually is kind of smooth here, it's also a differentiable function, so we can just minimize this upper, this sort of worst case loss and train a robust network in this manner. And then once we trained it, we can of course use the same technique to verify that a point cannot change its label once we've made a prediction. And that's the basic idea of these convex outer regions, convex you know, relaxation approaches. To, to verification. All right, so let me just show a few examples now. Um, here's a sort of a simple toy example. Here's a thing on the left where I just have red and blue dots. The red dots here show, um, or one class, I mean, there, there's no tr training or testing here. This is just some, some, some examples. If I train a normal neural network, I get this decision boundary. And this decision boundary has these adversarial examples, right? There's a case where this is a red dot here, but uh, you know, in some region around it, there's a portion that's classified as being blue. That's an adversarial example for this class, right? And of course there is, because this, this classifier doesn't know anything about these boxes. It just knows about the points. So of course there are gonna be examples. It's sort of, you know, it's, it's obvious. But the point I wanna make is that, you know, it's very possible to get this classifier instead, which actually avoids all those things. And this is the, actually the exact classifier that we, that we learn when we minimize our robust upper bound instead of minimizing normal training loss. So we're able to train, still importantly, a nonlinear classifier. We're not losing the nonlinearity properties. We're training one that is certifiably robust on this data set. Um, and we do similar things, on, at least on small scales, on things like MNIST so far. We can, we can scale it up. Oh, not so far, but back then when we first did it, we could scale on MNIST. This is with an L infinity norm of epsilon equals 0 0.1. So I can change each pixel uh, ranging from 0 to 1 by 0 0.1. 
It's a relatively small perturbation region, um, but that's the sort of what we can validate these days. Um, if I train a normal model, I get pretty good performance, but you know, any sort of bound, and I, you actually can, not, that, not, that, that's, you can get pretty close to getting 100% error actually in practice too. Um, if I train a robust linear classifier, I, I didn't really go over this, but there actually are closed form solutions for robust linear classifiers. It's totally possible to train them, very much like an SVM, uh, to, be, to, be, to be clear. Um, but the problem here is that if you, if you sort of throw out nonlinearity, throw out the power of a neural network, you lose a lot of capabilities in your, in your classifier. So your classifier has much, much worse accuracy. Whereas if we use our, our, our approach, um, we can get the same level of accuracy as, as we have with normal classifier. To be clear, that's actually not common for more complex data sets than MNIST. You, you, get, you suffer a big penalty on, provable, on, on robust performance, but here we actually, or sorry, on standard performance. Um, but importantly, I can guarantee that no matter how many papers are written you know, in the next on new attacks and new methods for attacking these things and you know, new clever ways to, to fool classifiers, no one is ever going to get more than 3.7% error, error on our classifier, on the MNIST test set. Right? And this is a pretty nice guarantee to have, uh, especially given you know, how often non-guaranteed methods were, were able to be broken um, in, in, in recent history. Okay, so and this is great, but, but what about going a little bit beyond that? You know, the, the key bottleneck here was that these bounds, to commute them exactly, it's, it is quadratic in the number of uh, hidden units in the network, which is just not something you can really do. Um, you, know, you can't have million uh, hidden unit networks as is common for bigger classifiers. So what we do instead in the case of, um, of uh, larger networks and, uh, and with, with more hidden units, is we actually can use a technique based upon uh, random projections. And you wouldn't necessarily use this, you might not want to use this at test time, I mean, you can use it at test time, then you get high, gear, high, high probability bounds, um, but, or you could just compute the exact bounds at test time. The problem here, the real bottleneck with these methods though is the training. Training them is very, very slow, right, because you have to compute a lot of evaluations and gradients when you're training them. So during training time, we actually can use an approximation that where, where you can use things like, the, the bottleneck ends up being actually you have to, to compute these bounds, you have to sort of feed through an identity matrix through the whole network, and then compute row-wise, uh, or sorry, row-wise, L1 norms of the output here. But it turns out it's a really nice estimator for this function. It has to do with, uh, with, with a, a median estimator based upon Cauchy random matrices. So rather than feeding through a identity matrix and taking L1 norms, you feed through a random skinny Cauchy matrix um, and take medians at the last layer. And that's an unbiased estimator of the L1 norm of this quantity. And so by doing that, we can reduce our time from being quadratic to again being linear to compute these bounds. And it's about, I mean, you have to still have a random projection matrix so it's not exactly the same, but it's maybe 50 times more. And I'm not too worried about 50 times worse uh, when it comes to things like, like uh, uh, CIFAR and things like this. You know, we can definitely train large networks now. Um, and we can also handle uh, other things like, like uh, residual connections. And this is some, some work out of, I don't know why I had this one citation here, uh, and then not others. Um, now, the, the, the point, and this is really both a computation and memory uh, saver here, because it's saving both computation and, and memory, because you don't have to store all these, all, all, you know, you, there's, there's a lot of terms you have to store, otherwise you don't have to store here. Um, so with doing this, you can have now things to scale to see far. We get you know reasonable, uh, well by some definition reasonable maybe uh, error bounds on uh, provable error bounds on on the robust bounds. But the point I now want to highlight is these are the results we get on CIFAR at MNIST, both for larger perturbation sizes and you know going from MNIST to CIFAR. So I can guarantee, for example, that with um, a perturbation allowance of two out of two fifty five with a resonant architecture there was no way to get an error uh, more than 46%. Um, and the standard error without, you know, of, of this architecture, without any uh, uh, perturbations, is 31%. Now, the, the, the point I want to make there is, is that's great, but those numbers are not very good, right? That's pretty bad performance for CIFAR. We're in the, you know, 6% error on CIFAR. is no problem. You can get it in 10 minutes. Uh, these days to training. I guess they've even brought it down to like one minute uh, if you do training properly, if you do a lot of tricks. Uh, CFR is trivial now. And we can't even get less than, you know, 46% error. Now, the other point I want to make, though, is that this is not solely a problem of these provable methods. So the same is actually true of our, uh, of our provably, uh, sorry, our empirically robust models. 
So the best models that we really know how to train for CIFAR at this, at this level of robust error is still 28%. So you know, there's a big gap there. So there's lots of room to improve this. And actually, with the next technique we're going to talk about, we are actually improving that. So we're able to, to bring this down a little bit and get a pretty, for some, again, with the caveat here, for some classes of models, we can actually can get the provable bound pretty close to what we can do empirically. But still, that's pretty bad. right? To say that all the best we know how to do is 28% error on, on CIFAR with a tiny, tiny perturbation. You know, so it's two, like you, you, you couldn't see this, right? Two out of 56, that, that's imperceptible to people. That's, that's not good. And this is also why I sort of come back to this notion. I mean, and I think this ties in with, 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 with what Alex was saying before about how the fact is, you know, we, there may just, you maybe it could be the only reason we can learn CIFAR at all. I mean, CIFAR is really hard if you looked at it, right? Like, I, I can't tell what half those things are. Um, so there's little blurry things that I have no idea what they are. And how on earth, by looking at just, you know, 60,000 of these things, can we really know? what a dog is from these little, these little blurry images, right? It is possible that the only reason why we get anywhere close to 40, you know, to 6% to, to, uh, error on CIFAR is precisely because of these little sort of, you know, imperceptible but generalizable non-robust features on CIFAR. So this could be a fundamental problem with CIFAR, but, but I don't think that's actually a great explanation either. We know there is some visual system. I mean, maybe CIFAR is a bad example because it's, it's so blurry and so weird. But you know, ImageNet's similar too, right? We know there is a visual system, i.e. our brain, um, that can distinguish very easily between different types of, of you know, uh, or, 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 or still sees things the same when you add a little tiny bit of noise to it. So I don't really buy this argument. Certainly don't buy the argument that you can't do this. I mean, yes, it, you can, of course, construct examples where the, the adversary examples exist, period. But with bounds like, with, with threat models like this, i.e., I can change a tiny amount of, uh, you know, a tiny amount of the intensity of each different channel, this, we are not close to being the regime that Nicholas was talking about where we're actually changing the semantic content of the image. We're nowhere close. These images are the same images as what we see. You know, we see the same exact thing. And somehow, we are unable to build a classifier that can distinguish between those two. And I think that is a big problem and a big question that we should answer when we, if, if, if we're really to claim that we understand what these networks are doing. OK, so with that being said, um, and that's actually going to apply equally well that statement to the next set too. I should have left that for the, sort of the final talk, but I can't even see these numbers without, without emphasizing those things. Um, OK, so let me then uh, mention a little bit more, maybe a little bit more briefly here, because I'm, I'm trying to finish like. 4.30, so, okay. Um, let me talk about uh, the other strategy we use to get, um, to verify these things. And, and this really is the other dominant strategy these days. So, so there's, there's these convex relaxation, but there's also this relatively more recent approach of randomized smoothing. Um, it was actually first sort of investigated actually in the context of differential privacy um, by, by, by a team from, from Columbia. Um, uh, and, and I think some of our work here just kind of codified it a little bit and also gave tighter bounds for what we can achieve here. But, but the basic idea, I think, is, has been thought about for a little while. So randomized smoothing is a very different notion of how we get bounds on a classifier. So whereas before, in these deterministic things, we were thinking about trying for an actual classifier to enumerate the reachable region of a classifier, randomized smoothing does something else. So the idea is the following. When we kind of think intuitively about adversarial examples, we think of them as kind of these uh, you know, regions of incorrect classes that kind of jut close to our points, right? So you know, we have a point there. If I were to say like randomly sample noise around that point, things all work fine. It's, you, know, you can have a pretty big radius and still do perfectly well on that point. Um, but we know that there's somehow a, a really close by point that has a different class, and you can find that by searching adversarially. Right, so that means that some sort of region kind of, kind of sticks out really close to our current point into that, and you know, really close to our current point into that space. So the obvious solution now is, well, what's happening here is our decision boundary is just too sharp. It's too weird and you know, cut up by this weird ReLU nonlinearity we have, but all the other ones do it the same, to be honest. I mean, whatever nonlinearity we have, it's like these weird things to the, to the space. 
I cut it up in a weird way, basically effectively you know, have a high Lipschitz constant, right? Because you can change the input very little and get a very big difference in output uh, activations. Um, so the way we can get around that is just by smoothing, post hoc, kind of smoothing our classifier. And in particular, if we, instead of sort of just taking points and classifying them by what the, what the network says right there, if we could actually sort of convolve this prediction with a Gaussian, or in other words, in practice, you know, sample a bunch of points from a Gaussian around this thing, and take the majority vote, that classifier will look something like this, a much more smooth version of this that wouldn't have the same adversarial example as the other one had. And this is exactly what, what we're going to do here. Oops, I actually might have even, <laughs> I think I was saying that in the last slide. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit more about this. So we're going to smooth the boundary by essentially, instead of predicting the, the normal point, we're going to, no, this, but, but with the base classifier F, we're going to predict uh, with some classifier G, which is basically the, the most likely class under uh, Gaussian noise added to this point. And importantly, this noise is not adversarial, and nor, nor are we trying to somehow sample, uh, you know, find with this, with this random sampling the actual adversarial point. No, we're trying to actually sort of, sort of get a smoother notion of what the majority class is in that region, and that smooths the underlying classifier. Um, and it was proposed in a lot of contexts, actually, as a heuristic defense, um, and it worked okay, but they always sort of overclaimed what it could actually do. Um, uh, but then, actually, some work uh, preceding ours um, demonstrated this actually can, be, can give, give bounds. Um, but our analysis, actually, which, which I think has, has brought this to the forefront a lot to a certain extent, um, was actually sort of a way of simplifying it from a more sort of probabilistic perspective. Is also, it also uh, gave tighter bounds. In fact, the, the bounds we have actually are tight. They're the tightest bounds you can give because um, they're actually they, they are an equality in the case of a linear classifier. So there, there's some classifier that achieves our bounds. Um, okay, so what is, I mean, just uh, again, some more some intuition, what does this look like? What this looks like is, instead of classifying, you know, here, now I'm back to the panda um, example here, so switched uh, context entirely. Um, if I want to classify this panda, I don't just classify the panda. What I do is, is I add a bunch of random noise to this panda, and I say, okay, what's this, what are all these images? And I take the most likely class and predict that instead, right? And um, now, as one little note, which I'll mention later, this does require that our base classifier can classify noisy images, not just norm, uh, normal images. So actually, to, to train this classifier, we end up having to train it differently on these noisy images rather than on the original images. Um, that's also an important point. Um, but but it does. Uh, if you do that, these things can work quite well. Okay. So if you do this, let me now give a statement of the kind of guarantees we get about, uh, from our from our um, randomized smoothing procedure. Um, I'm going to focus on this in the binary case now. So, given some x, we're going to let g of x be the prediction, or y hat was equal to g of x be the prediction of the smooth classifier at that point. So it is the most probable class under this Gaussian smoothing. Um, and I'm going to let p, which has to be greater than one half, otherwise it would be the other class, right? So p, p greater than one half, be the associated probability of this class under the smoothing distribution. So basically, when, when, you know, what's when I when I add this Gaussian noise. P is how often that class comes up. Okay. And the guarantee says, then we know that for, importantly, for this smooth classifier, so this is only giving a guarantee on the smooth versus classifier, not on the underlying F, but for the smooth classifier, if I perturb X by some delta, then actually we know that this perturbation also equals the same class. So in other words, we are robust to these perturbations for any delta such that uh, the, no the L2 norm of delta is less than this term here, where sigma is the variance, the, or the standard deviation, uh, of the Gaussian noise that we're adding. Um, and uh, phi inverse here is the inverse CDF of a normal Gaussian distribution. And that's just because that function looks like this. So this function at, at zero, or sorry, at 0 0.5, that means P is basically a coin toss. So we don't know what it is. Then you can basically certify nothing because you could always, you know, change a, a, a little change could change anything. But as basically as p increases, in other words, as more and more of our space around the point looks like the majority class, this means we can actually can certify a higher and higher region up to the point where actually as p approaches one, we actually can certify as big a region as we want. Um, that only works because the Gaussian has infinite support. So if you're doing this exactly. 
and you always get the correct class, then the only way that could actually happen is if the entire space was that one class. That's not actually a, a meaningful thing here. You're not going to get that. But as you get higher, you can, you can certify a higher and higher radius around the point. And so you can buy, as, as, you, as, as the empirical probability of the majority class for the smooth classifier, a lot of qualifications there, but hopefully that, that all made sense, increases, you're able to certify a higher and higher radius. And not just sort of, you know, we think it's robust there, but actually guarantee that the smooth classifier will not change on that. Um, in the interest of time, I'm actually not going to give the proof. It's, it's a quick proof, but um, I, I've given a talk at, at Simon's. So if you want to find the video that I gave at Simon's and go through this with, with, with similar, well, these slides were the same, so you can, you can go through that. Uh, unfortunately, I, I do want to get to my last point uh, and show some results here. Um, you cannot prove any of the original classifier. This is only giving results about the smooth classifier. So the process is we're going to replace our process of classifier, of a classifier, with this notion of a randomized classifier instead. And that is our new classifier, period. That's what we're going to do. And that's going to be our classifier. And that's what we're going to get guarantees on. OK, so let me actually give a few caveats and some fine print here. Um, OK, first one we just said. <laughs> Not anything about f he's saying here. Right? That's actually very hard to do. This is why we have the other kinds of bounds if you want them. Very hard with the same things about f. But you know what? A randomized version, that's a good classifier too. Why are we restricting ourselves to non-randomized classifiers? I don't know. Um, now, in practice, you cannot usually actually compute the exact probability p if they use Monte Carlo sampling, of course. But that's actually fine. You can get a very high probability bound on, on the, on the um, certification. It's actually really arbitrarily high because it, the, the, the failure probability is the bounds, uh, the, the, the number of samples you need grows, you know, not very much with the failure probability. So you can you can get as high probability as you want with that. Um, and to be clear, when I say high probability, I don't mean that like an adversary could flaunt that probability, that high probability guarantee. I mean high probability over my own internal randomness, which is you know independent of the adversary. So it's it's a meaningful guarantee here. Um, but I also want to mention that you know this all sounds good, and, and that picture of, of, of the panda that seems really impressive because I was adding you know Gaussian noise, and that seems like a lot of Gaussian noise. Um, I want to make a point though: um, we are certifying a tiny radius compared to the noise that we are adding to that image. The reason is we are adding independent Gaussian noise to each pixel, but I'm certifying an L2 radius that scales like the standard deviation of that noise. In other words. The size of the radius that I'm, I'm bounding in, in a certified sense um, is square root d smaller than the amount of noise we're adding to there. Right? So th this is a tiny radius. We're talking about certifying radii of one total pixel value or two total pixel values in L2 norm. That means we can change one pixel if we want to, or two pixels, or spread it out over the image if we wanted to, and these kind of things. But they are tiny perturbations that we're still doing. So we're still in the regime. You know, I'm not at all worried about what Nick was talking about, because we're not even close to being able to change semantically the image with these perturbations. We're nowhere near that. So let's be, you know, let's be realistic here about what we're doing. We're trying to change. We're trying to adjust a problem where the, the differences are imperceptible. And that's the domain we're, we're, we're working on right here. Um, so this just sort of shows well, sort of the kind of guarantees we get. So we can basically get um, what these guarantees show is that these show with, for a different radius, um, what is the accuracy that we are able to certify. So if I'm allowed to perturb you know, up to one pixel, this is on CIFAR now, up, up to one normalized pixel, I can certify that no classifier will have, you know, uh, no attack will be able to achieve less than that accuracy. If, I, if I'm allowed to certify two pixels, I can guarantee that no attack can have less than that accuracy. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the sort of the guarantee we have. Um, and we have, and of course, um, actually maybe I won't, I, I have some things on the, on the next slide too. We can do a similar thing for ImageNet. Um, the key thing here is that as you, well, one key thing is that as you increase um, sigma, that's your noise you add to your image, you can, you basically, for higher sigma, or for lower sigma, you're able to get higher accuracy because you're adding less noise to the image, but you have less robustness, and so you, you sort of fall off quicker. Whereas the more noise you add, you have a longer tail of robustness. You can certify more robustness l later on, but you, you, you're not as accurate at the beginning there. And that makes sense, actually, because um, you know, what we're doing here is we're adding noise, and we're asking the thing to classify it. 
this is a starfish, right? Do you see there? That's the class of it. When I add one sigma equals one, a pixel of noise to that, you can't see a starfish anymore. And so this actually doesn't matter how good a classifier is. It's not going to get this performance. So you, you, you do, just like always, right, there is this trade-off between accuracy and robustness. And when you have robustness like this, um, you are you know, going to sacrifice some accuracy. Um, OK. Let me, I have eight minutes left. Let me talk about the challenges. So the, the first thing is, is like, and I, I keep coming back to this, because I think people see pictures like this, and they hear, you know, 60% robust performance, and or we're, or we're getting close to, you know, the level of normal nominal performance, um, and they think that somehow these problems are solved. But, but, they're, but they're not, and we still don't understand really what's going on here. Because even the state of the art right now, the best we can do empirically, I mean, to be clear, I mean empirically also, right? The best we can do right now is come up with models that can certify or empirically defend against a tiny, tiny perturbation region, which for the most part is imperceptible to humans. Really, MNIST is the only one, uh, because it's so simple, it's basically you can solve it by binarizing it. Um, it's a simple problem. But that's the only one where, to be frank, you can even really see the perturbations we're talking about here. The rest, there is no concern about changing classes with that, with that much of a change. We can't see the difference. These are semantically identical to humans. And we can't even solve that still. So I think that you know, it's great the progress we're making here. We are making substantial, I mean, a couple years ago, we couldn't talk about any sort of guarantees whatsoever. And we can now. But we're a long way from getting the level of robustness that we actually want that we as humans just take for granted. Right, we, we, sort of, we, we know what we're capable of. Uh, we know that if I change a few pixels, uh, you know, I won't see a, an airplane out the window, or I won't think you know, this, this computer is an airplane. Um, but it's nothing like that for deep networks. They, they are exploiting whatever these you know, features that Bill was talking about, whatever these robust or non-robust features are, they are using those. And whether or not we can build things that don't use those is really an open question. Um, number two. Even though I think we have plenty far to go, I'm not concerned about the norm thing. I'm not, I should clarify, I'm not concerned about the norm thing from a standpoint of, of being necessary conditions. Any robust model should be able to deal with the size of perturbations that we're talking about here under norm balls, just period, to be called a reasonably robust model. However, we're not talking about semantic changes, nothing like that yet. However, it's also the case that we should think about going beyond norms, not because they are not necessary, but because they're not even close to being sufficient. Right? There are semantic changes in images that have huge differences in norm, but change the image almost nothing. Right? So an example, and actually I want to talk about this in a second. So an example would be like you know, shifting pixels over in an MNIST digit by like one pixel. That will flip entirely some pixels, and so the L infinity perturbation difference would be one for that, but it's semantically the same image. There's no difference. So how do we encode that? Um, the, other, the other sort of now from a maybe more methodological standpoint is that there's this really strange property that you might have noticed from these two approaches I talked about. Um, the work on linear programming bounds was entirely specific to the kind of network. It was about ReLU networks. We were forming you know, linear programs to describe these ReLU networks in this way. For other activations, you need other uh, you know, relaxations. You need other bounds to bound other activations, et cetera. It's really complicated, actually. The, the, the math gets pretty complicated pretty, pretty quickly. Um, the randomized smoothing, on the other hand, never actually once used the property that F was a neural network. It's completely oblivious to what the underlying classifier actually is. It can apply to anything. Anything that outputs a prediction, you can apply randomized smoothing to. So somehow there has to be some middle ground here. Right? We have to, I, I think, if we're going to get bounds that are tight, that are anywhere close to the level of robustness that we think there should be of these, of these things, I believe that we need bounds that take into account the structure of the network and probably which apply some amount of randomization because it seems like a really powerful strategy. You know, the, 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 a randomized classifier seems to be inherently kind of a little bit more powerful classifier in some sense, or you know, a, a smooth version of that seems to be an easier thing to deal with than a normal deep network. 
So I really think that there's, 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 inner, there's, inner, there's me, middle ground here, which is going to be the key thing to, uh, to moving forward. And the last thing I'll say is that we, we but um, just on this point of going beyond norms altogether, we have been making some progress there too. So, um, you know, there's obvious problems with L-infinity balls is that these things are not, you know, tiny, well, th th those are all L-infinity perturbations. There's, there's L0, L2, and, um, and L-infinity. Um, and we haven't solved them yet, but it's still important to think about other things because there's lots of manipulations of images you'd want to think about, like translation or rotation or distortions. And we have come up with a metric that sort of captures these things pretty well, um, uh, at least for sort of small deformations, which is Wasserstein distance um, in image space. So I'm not going to get into Wasserstein distance. I have you know, two minutes left, so I'm not going to do it too much. Basically, Wasserstein distance is the solution to a linear programming involving basically thinking about the image pixels as sort of a distribution. How much can I uh, transport the mass of the distribution to lead to another image? So it's sort of thinking about like shifting the, 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 and kind of stretching the mass of this, of this image. Um, and it's, it's actually given by the solution to an LP. Um, and what we do is we actually think about perturbation regions that are the set of all images that have some small Wasserstein distance with the original image. And for this thing, it actually is hard to do this, and we're not even talking about certified methods yet. We're still, now it's actually still back in, on empirical robustness. We're actually able to have some nice properties. So if you look at sort of Wasserstein attacks versus, so, so, so these, these ones here were, um, were L2, sorry, were norm-bounded attacks. The attack themselves doesn't really capture much meaning in the image, right? It's sort of, sort of this random thing, which is like, oh, these, these pixels might be good to, to, to mess around with. Um, for Wasserstein attacks, these are the perturbations that we actually are applied. So you know, we take this image here, we apply this perturbation, and you get a bird. Um, you take this, this is a car, you apply this, and you get a deer, et cetera. Um, it still looks the same right, to us. Right? There's still no difference here, as far as you can see. Um, but what happens is the perturbation regions themselves actually correspond more to semantic features of the image, which I think is the important point here, is that somehow this is a better notion of what it's shifting to make things work differently, which gets a lot of these, a lot it's a similar point to, to, to what Alex had about, the, about sort of the nature of these robust models. This is sort of a, a similarly nice nature of robust attacks uh, that makes this nice. Um, and we can do robust training and Aristotle training of that, and we get more robust models to this attack, but I, I, won't, I won't go into that. Um, that actually is, is all I have uh, for today. So again, I think there's a huge interplay right now going on between, or a potential for interplay, they're, they're pretty separate right now, between how we build these robust models. We have convex approaches, we have randomized approaches, and on kind of on the, on, on the third leg here, we have this notion of how do we go beyond uh, our traditional notion of allowable perturbations to actually achieve something which is more in line with what we think of semantically, or a little bit more in line with what we think of semantically as equivalent. Um, and really, a lot of the code for a lot of these things, for all those three different, three different pieces of work, um, is all on our, on our labs page. And we have a lot more, you know, there, there's papers on my website, and we have a lot more information on that. So thanks very much. And now we can have a well-deserved uh, break. But I guess, I guess we'll take a few questions, but I don't want to stand between you and, uh, and, and, and some food. So let's, let's maybe have just one or two. Yeah. Um, so which models did you use? For these and how do you think, it seems like you focused on mainly classification models. Yeah. How do you think this is to other Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, so, so, first thing, so first, what models we used, we basically used more or less resnets of whatever size we could. So for the convex methods, those don't scale very well. So those are pretty small models. We're talking about, you know, uh, tens of thousands of hidden units at most. For the randomized smoothing with the ImageNet, we use a normal ResNet 18, or no, sorry, ResNet 50 for that, because um, those it doesn't really matter what the underlying thing is. You just you just use it. So we use a ResNet 50 for that. Um, object detection, yes, that's a great question. So it does become harder because the notion of, I mean, the loss functions they use for object detection are really kind of weird, right? But what they actually put, you know, that they have uh, uh, all the, you know, these, these, um, I mean. You first propose regions and you classify those regions and things like this, right? It's, it's a very multi-stage process. So I think it is possible, but I think we haven't even done a work, enough work, frankly, on the empirical version of robustness for object detection or for segmentation to the point where I think we don't even quite know what the right loss function is to address, to try to bound in a formal way for provable guarantees. 
Um, so it's definitely, I, I think it's a really good area to think about because I, I like thinking about even attacks on those spaces as well. But uh, we don't yet know what the right loss is to even, that they, we're even trying to get, you know, what, what's our objective? What are we even trying to guarantee? I think that is not yet known. As well as the threat model there is even harder because there you have, you know, can I change just the object itself? Can I change other parts of the, of, of the image? What's the, what's the allowable permissions I'm allowed? I mean, I guess if you just go with L-Infinity, then you have something similar. Um, so maybe it's a good starting point, but I think we don't yet know what the right criteria is to, to, to even optimize. Uh, no, we train them from scratch. Because especially randomized smoothing, um, they have to be residents that work on those noisy images. So you have to train those from scratch. You can't use a pre-trained one, it won't work. Uh, on either approach, you cannot use pre-trained. So actually, one really thing interesting happens about the convex balance, which I, which I didn't really mention. If I take a normal network, trained normally, and compute one of those bounds, they are always vacuous. They are always equal to one. Uh, you know, so it's the probability of, of or, or rather, you know, there's, you, you can certify a radius of zero, always, essentially, or maybe, you know, point zero, 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 one, right? They are vacuous entirely. They only work when you train the network to minimize that upper bound. So our bound itself, because it's, there's so many levels, levels of relaxation, um, it really requires, that in order to work, it requires that you train the network to minimize that bound. And then you will build a network that is inherently sort of, you know, uh, regularize enough, and it's actually a very strong regularizer, to ensure that that criterion will be will be a good one, and that's sort of the the rough approach that we that we use. But that's actually very important. Otherwise, the bounds will be vacuous if you apply them to anything but a classifier trained to minimize that bound. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for the talk. I enjoy and I'm learning a lot. And my question is, is that a similarity between robust and adversarial example to robust and distribution shift of the data or there's no question? Yeah, so the, the, the <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so the question was, is, is there is a similarity to robustness between distribution shift and robustness to uh, test time examples. In some sense, you, you, you really hope so, right? Because, you know, a distribution shift could like shift the examples within that threat model, and so then, then it's okay. So I guess, you know, in, in some formal sense, if your new distribution uh, gives samples that are entirely in the, in the perturbation regions allowed by a threat model, then yes. Um, but the big caveat here is that the distribution shift we actually see in practice doesn't really matter. Uh, these things are equally sensitive to it. So a great example is that um, Ben Recht uh, and colleagues have some recent work on, they tried to recreate the CIFAR data set um, using as exactly you know, a process as they could to mirror the original collection process. And they find that basically every single classifier loses like five percentage points of, of accuracy. Um, so you know, think of it gets you know, 98, and they're, they're, actually, they're actually still ordered, amazingly enough. They're, 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 not like random, they're not like randomly ordered. Like, so everything drops by like you know, 5%. So you know, if you were, 94% before you're 89%. Um, and so there is obviously in ImageNet, or in CIFAR, some really weird distribution shifts, maybe about how they labeled them, or even though they followed it as well as they possibly could, you know, which ones were picked out of this million images thing to do it. But if you train a robust model, you see almost that exact same 5% drop. So we are not gaining robustness yet to the kinds of even very small distributional shift that we see. In other words, what I would say is, we don't know how to quantify the threat model, the allowable perturbation region that we see in most distributional shift settings. And that's the key. We, have to, we would have to describe what, what we are allowing, what kind of distributional shift we are allowing, integrate that into the threat model, and train based upon that. Because unless we do that, we just, these things, you know, they don't generalize outside their threat model as you would expect them not to, right? So that's, that's the issue. All right. All right. Since we are running late, let's thank the speaker.